Revolution, I explored 11 subgenres of heavy metal and over 400 years of music history. The show aired on networks around the world and was a big success, but there was one glaring omission. There was no episode on metal's most underground and aggressive subgenre, extreme metal. Extreme metal is a term that covers a number of metal styles, including death metal, grindcore, doom metal, the first wave of black metal, Norwegian black metal, Swedish extreme metal, and more. Building on the sound of thrash, these styles ramped up metal's speed and complexity. But there's a question about extreme metal that I've long wanted to answer. How is there so much diversity in a genre that to most people sounds like noise? I see what there is, it's best to know this kind of fear. Into all infinity. Certainly, it has indeed been a day of suffering. If anyone's paid attention to the t-shirts I've worn during this series, you'll already know that I'm a huge fan of the darker and more brutal forms of metal. But even though I consider myself an extreme metal expert, I've always struggled to accurately define it. So to get started, I want to ask extreme metal musicians how they define this music. Extreme music is for extreme people. There's a lot of notes, there's a lot of aggression, there's a lot of fury, and it's fast. I mean, th those are some key components to it, and, and then that's not for everyone. I mean, you know, it, it's not easy listening. I can't imagine your average sort of white bread housewife doing laundry and then listening to, uh, you know, Blast Me the Holy Ghost. I mean, I just, I, I don't hear that. What is extreme music? What is extreme metal? It, it's a very pragmatic term. It's the guitar style, it's the way of using the drums, and it's the particular usage of vocals. One of the main lines from extreme metal and just traditional metal or regular metal is actually when you go from ah to ah. I define extreme metal as taking all the musical elements of heavy metal and then pushing them one step further to the point whereby you start departing from conventional aspects of music. So most outsiders would say, oh, that's just a noise. Um, it's actually a very complex form of music, and delving into that complexity is part of the fun. One of the first metal albums I heard that sounded extreme was Venom's Welcome to Hell. I had listened to Iron Maiden, Motorhead, and bands that were part of the new wave of British heavy metal, but Venom was way more intense. So I'd come to Newcastle, England, the home of Venom, to find out why they were so extreme. So it's the early 80s, the new wave of British heavy metal is starting to explode. Can you talk about to what extent you felt like you were part of Nawabum or you felt like you were something completely different? I think, to be, to be perfectly honest, 
we didn't really feel that much of a part of it. I mean, we rebelled against that squeaky clean style and, you know, everybody trying to produce everything as best they could and all this kind of stuff. And whether it was youthful arrogance or whatever, you know, we just did what came naturally. But what we did, by whatever means and by whatever force, became something entirely different to what everybody else was doing. The first thing that comes to mind that separates Venom are the vocals. You had stuff like Motorhead, where it was definitely not just traditional singing, but you know, Lemmy always had a, a, a tinge of melody, where Kronos was just really, he was, he really was just kind of barking it out. It's like the first kind of prototypical guttural stuff. The vocal style played a big part in giving the band its identity. Maybe that caused restrictions in melody and all that kind of thing, like, but we were never about that. You know, we were just about that, that raw punch in the face. Venom put on these amazing shows, and yeah, looking back, a little bit hocus pocus and you know, decidedly cheesy, but as a youth, bands like Venom, I think just really captured people's imagination. You know, you had Kiss, and they looked the part, but they sing about love and women and bikinis and stuff like that. Whereas Venom, they were singing about the devil and, you know, Elizabeth Bathory, and that just was uh, really vulgar. It's very hard to look at Venom with fresh eyes, in the, you know, today. They seem a little bit absurd. But at the time, they were actually quite shocking. While other bands were alluding to sort of Satanism and the occult, they were taking it beyond what other people were doing, saying, yes, we are in league with Satan. We're not just interested in it, we are the real thing. You know, you had Black Sabbath and Black Widow and all these other people, but they still really weren't stuffing it in people's faces the way we did. You know, the pentagram and all that kind of stuff really hadn't been seen before that. I think we all had an interest in the sort of occult side of things. And mine definitely came from my grandfather, who was big on horror movies, like the old Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff stuff. And he would let me stay up late and watch the horror movies. So was the primary objective for Venom to shock people? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. Just to stick it in their faces and say, right, there you go, what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. And if they ran away screaming, then great. Venom's extreme music and imagery set a new blueprint for heavy metal in the early 80s, and the band's sound spread through the metal community. And the next band to pick up the extreme metal torch was Switzerland's Hellhammer. about how Hellhammer started. How did that all come together? Well, I grew up in a tiny, tiny farm village of 1,500 inhabitants in the 1970s. And I was the odd kid out, a total black sheep. So for many years in my youth, I was in a very lonely, very desperate place. In order to somehow survive that emotionally, I, uh, I resorted to music. I became such a fanatic that, of course, I dreamt of playing in a band myself, which led directly to me forming this band called Hellhammer. When Hellhammer started out, it was largely a Venom clone and probably a very deficient one at that. We didn't know anything, we didn't have any advice, we didn't have any connection. And we were complete amateurs on the instruments, laughed at continuously for years in Switzerland, even in the metal scene, and people said, that's noise what you're doing, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. So we were very frustrated because we wanted to do more. I wanted to create better music, I wanted to be more dimensional. And so we decided to start Celtic Frost. And that's when we became a real band. We were no longer the nobodies from Switzerland. Now that you had changed to Celtic Frost, what were the goals of that band, that new project? 
with Celtic Frost. We thought that being extreme not only meant being extreme about the, the lyrical themes or the imagery you use, but also being extreme in the sense of the musical inspirations or the musical styles you try to incorporate. You know, we like Joy Division, Susie and the Banshees, The Cure, Sisters of Mercy, Christian Death from America, 45 Grave, Roxy Music. You know, there are many, many more shades and colors to darkness than just black. Celtic Frost, what they really brought was this lack of boundaries. They're bringing in choirs and like, you know, ambient music and like really taking metal into new places. So I think Celtic Frost really laid the groundwork for a real sense of possibility in extreme metal. There was this tendency to say, well, in metal you're not allowed to do this or to do that. And we found that ridiculous. We didn't want to lose the heaviness and the radicalness of Hellhammer, but we wanted to do an endless amount of things on top of that. I thought it was possible to combine heaviness with something that approached art. Unlike Venom, Celtic Frost wasn't about shock. They were expanding the sound of extreme metal and striving to create an artistic statement. But still, these bands were part of a fringe underground movement so how did extreme metal grow to become the massive international subgenre that it is today? Pioneering extreme metal bands like Venom and Celtic Frost were becoming internationally recognized. But in the meantime, there was a new extreme music style developing in English cities like Birmingham, a place well known for its metal pedigree. But this sound was a far cry from Black Sabbath and Judas Priest. <laughs> I want to start by talking about the state of, of metal in England in the early to mid 80s. Since an early, from an early age, the guitar based rock metal was always popular in England. You know, you, you would have Iron Maiden, Saxon, Judas Priest, Motorhead in the top 10. But me and my friends, we, wanted, we went further. We wanted Celtic Frost, we wanted Bathory, uh, Sepultura, Voivod, Metallica, and Slayer. Bands like this, you know, we wanted the harder stuff. In the case of Napalm Death and the early British grind scene, stuff like Iron Maiden was like pub rock to them. Those guys are into all kinds of heavy sounds and heavy music. And they start to get involved in the underground tape trading scene. So in addition to stuff like Hellhammer and Celtic Frost, they get to hear a lot of really fast, really aggressive underground music. Yeah, because of the tape trading community, we were listening to bands from the States and from Europe who were also playing pretty fast. That's how we discovered bands like GBH, Exploited, Discharged. All that was influencing us. And we started to cross over, you know, start listening to hardcore punk as well. All these punk bands were singing about real things, so lyrically it was a little bit more grounded. You know, these bands had something different to say as opposed to, you know, Hail Satan and whatever, you know. But. They were a political anarcho-punk band, but one that was sort of weren't part of the scene as such. They stood apart from the scene, and they became a different animal because they were influenced by the thrashier end of metal. And they concocted this idea, I think, just to go faster and faster. I mean, there was fast bands. We'd seen Slayer, we'd seen Metallica early on, uh, we'd seen Venom, but Napalm Death. They just took it to a whole other level. <laughs> Oh! 
The blast beat became an important part of Napalm Death's music. Um, what is the blast beat? Uh, well, the blast beat would be the way I would describe it. I mean, you've got a rock beat like that, you know, and the Slayer beat. That's what I call the Slayer beat, you know? And then it's like double that. You know, that was the original blast beat for me, the one, you know, the... That blast beat that was brought in by early Napalm Death, it's kind of like a whole new level of an excitement and speed, and it just kind of propels things forward. It immediately is a dividing line. It's a bit too angry for me, a bit too aggressive, a bit too doom-laden, a bit too subversive. So let's lighten the mood here a little. Ow! Was that it? Yeah, basically. How come songs that are so short? People didn't quite get what Napalm Death were. They were actually a joke, you know. They were actually a laughing stock to a lot of people. Not to me. I think they were bordering on experimental music and avant-garde, really. You know, Near 8 was proud as hell to release it. And um, I remember distinctly mailing out about five promo copies of Napalm Death Scum. One went to John Peel. <laughs> John Peel. Hello, 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 as we say in our country. This is John Peel in London for Rock Radio. This next is Napalm Death, and this is from their LP, Scum. John Peel played all sorts of weird and wonderful music from a huge range of genres. I was a teenager at the time, and one night I heard this noise, you know, this blast, with growling and impenetrable guitars and blasting drums. They were tracks with sort of like these crazy names like Prison Without Walls and you know that kind of stuff. It totally blew me away. Well the Peel Sessions had a pretty big impact for you guys. Um, can you talk about you know what happened? And it was like yeah the first, second album got the like number one in the independent charts. We were above like the Pixies and Sonic Youth and all these indie noise bands that I'm into, and yeah. I was like, wow, you know, it's kind of surprised. But so the things started to just go pretty nuts from there, really. People looked at Napalm Death a different way. I don't know where, really. Napalm just kind of had this interest from the media. I think we ended up getting more airtime than Guns N' Roses. And I remember these Guns N' Roses fans going, how can that shit band Napalm Death get more, more time than Guns N' Roses? This is an outrage. We just thought it was funny, you know. <laughs> Napalm Death had become the underground darlings of the British music press, and their style was termed grindcore. But then Liverpool's carcass took grindcore to even greater extremes, giving its political message a grotesque visual and lyrical identity. Describe those early album covers and what was the impulse to take things in that direction at that time? We wanted to make the most brutalist, heaviest, nastiest album. And in some respects we succeeded, and in other respects musically we failed, because it's a, a musical abortion. But um, we were never really interested in the cartoonish elements of metal. We wanted it to be more... Uh, really? Yeah. yeah. Previously, heavy metal imagery was stuff that you could pretty much find airbrushed on the side of a van. You know, warlocks and warriors and even depictions of Satan weren't particularly frightening. These were real dead bodies. This was a whole other level of gore. Their ethos was to take all the sort of traditional metal, but they wanted to make it like real life gore, not just a horror movie pretend thing. I mean, it's really repulsive stuff. And again, the whole point was to push buttons, push envelopes. Yeah. Let's see how far we can take this. You know, my sister was a nurse. There was a medical dictionary, so I just started to use the, uh, you know, the photographs from medical books. It was seriously done with intent, making an analogy of like, dead corpse, dead corpse. You know, human or animal, what's a big deal? You know. We were trying to confuse people, obviously, because everyone in the band was either vegan or vegetarian. You know, well, we were teenagers. You know, we were all 17, but we weren't aggressive people. So, was shocking people? Was that very important to you? I don't think shock's the right word, that's what Alice Cooper territory. Yeah. Disturb people, I think, is better. You know. The first two Carcass albums were really pretty impenetrable. 
often seemed to be out of time. It was often unclear who was singing, what they were singing and everything. But what started out as an interest in medical terminology and bodies being cut up uh, ends up in their later albums as an interest in general decay within society. So it was a big change. Some of the stuff we'd done on the first records, we were hearing other bands doing it, and um, we realised how easily assimilated that style was. At that stage, it wasn't a novelty anymore, playing super fast, being down-tuned. I think we were out to prove something. We just wanted to do something that couldn't be copied as easily. I mean, we wanted to stay ahead of the pack. By the time Carcass releases Heartwork, there is very little grindcore left in Carcass. It was the sound of a band kind of reaching out for something different. There's a lot of technical progressive stuff on there. The songs are longer. They have a lot of movements that are definitely not typical of grindcore. And what that record in particular did was it created this tipping point for the genre. By combining extremity with melodic guitars, Carcass's new sound influenced many future metal bands, but it also marked the decline of British grindcore as a distinct metal movement. So what else was going on in the extreme metal underground? when I was a teenager, I remember hearing about this mysterious guy named Chuck Schuldiner, who was creating this really raw and brutal new form of metal out of Florida, of all places. Now, sadly, I can't meet with Chuck because he passed away in the early 2000s, so I've come to Morris Sound Studios, which became the home of the Florida death metal scene, to find out how this scene got started. Hey, Terry. Hey, Sam. How you doing, man? Good, man. So How's it going? I'm I want to talk about good. Chuck a good bit. To you. Tell me about his role in helping kickstart this scene. I, I first met Chuck in 1984 at a bar called Ruby's. That's where everyone played here. I saw a guy walking around carrying a bag of demo tapes, and I asked my friend, "Hey, you know what's up with this guy?" And he's like, "Hey, that, that's the guitar player of Death. You should go over and get that demo. It's awesome." And um, it was just incredible. You know, it was just so raw and heavy. I was a fan instantly. <laughs> Chuck was really a great musician, you know, some of his stuff, it really it was almost prog, but it was still Chuck. So, I mean, you see this, this really vast growth in him as a musician, I mean, it was all pushing boundaries. You could tell even early on, his songwriting, his song structuring, it wasn't just like, I'm just gonna scream and that's it. He wanted to make rhythms that were catchy and they had a purpose. They just weren't fillers in a song, they actually meant something. It was inconceivable to me that a band could be so heavy, you know, playing at speeds like that and doing it in a technical fashion was still a very new thing. And that's why, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Chuck Schuldiner is pretty much the godfather of death metal and death were pretty much the first death metal band. When did you first hear about the Florida death metal scene? When did that first start to trickle up to upstate New York? You know, probably with death leprosy coming out, we weren't really totally aware that Chuck was from Florida. But, you know, leprosy sounded so great, we wanted to know where that was done. And that was Morris Sound. And then all of a sudden, you had bands like Obituary and uh, Morbid Angel releasing records. And those were done at Morris Sound as well. And we thought, wow, this is, you know, this is a place we'd like to go.
There was clearly a style developing here in Florida, but the thing is, someone needed to harness this sound. And so I'm meeting with the producer, Scott Burns, who's credited for crafting the legendary Florida death metal sound. You know, back then, everyone laughed at us. Thrash was king and everyone thought death metal was shit. I just dug it because I liked anything that was over the top and extreme. These guys really wanted to be faster, heavier, and, and be taken as legitimate. But from a purely technical like production standpoint, it's hard to make things that are fast and noisy sound clean. Morris Sound was the first studio that really mastered a sound that would work well with fast double bass. The kick drums were audible. That was a big deal because I just don't think that a lot of those other producers back then knew what to do with fast double bass. Scott Burns and Morris Sound actually did, and it just sounded great. What was the key turning point where this death metal thing was really starting to take off? Well, you just started to see a complete shift of the bands doing demos. All of a sudden, the thrash bands were done, and it was all just death metal getting full coverage and all the zines and stuff. And that's when you started to see the record labels like Roadrunner and Metal Blade Earache snatching up everything that moved. I think a lot of eyes were on the death metal scene. There were a ton of great bands, and I was able to just go in in like a three-year period and sign everything from Sepultura to Obituary to Deicide, Suffocation, Malevolent Creation, Gore Guts, Immolation. At the same time I was doing that, you had Digby over at Earache signing Terrorizer and Morbid Angel, and these records all sold. That, you know, really kind of showed the rest of the music business that, you know, there was money to be made here. I come Death metal in Florida was starting to explode, and independent record labels were distributing this extreme music around the globe. And it was Cannibal Corpse who became death metal's biggest and most notorious band. When we got Cannibal together, all five of us were pretty much on the same page from the very beginning. We wanted to be a really dark band that had horror gore kind of lyrics and you know really fast aggressive death metal that's what we wanted to do right from the start the reason Campbell Corp really became death metal's top selling band is that they had that very immediate shock value you know it's not like morbid angel where it's like these sort of arcane you know satanic sumerian mythological lyrics you know it's just like you know fucked with a knife you know it's like Whoa, you know? We all thought that there were limitations on it because of the subject matter, because of how aggressive it is, because it's extreme. Even though they've never been on a major label, Cannibal Corpse definitely sold a lot of records and done extremely well for themselves. And I mean, certainly the controversies have helped. I mean, you know, they had the election with Bob Dole. You know, he came out in this massive news conference said, you know, Cannibal Corpse are ruining the entire country because of their lyrics. I want to talk to you tonight about the future of America about issues of moral importance and matters of social consequence. I'm talking about groups like Cannibal Corpse, Ghetto Boys, and Two Live Crew, about a culture, business that makes money from music, which extols the pleasure of raping, torturing, and mutilating women. Bob Dole made some comments bemoaning this society that we live in that allows our children to enjoy bands like Cannibal Corpse. And I have no idea what aid of his slipped that in to his speech as a talking point, but I do know that there were five dudes in Tampa who were eternally grateful for that. Bob Dole said, well, we're not trying to censor them. We're just trying to publicly shame them and let people know what they're doing. I said, well, we're not ashamed of what we're doing. We want people to know about what we're doing, so thank you for the free advertisement. When Cannibal Corpse starts being talked about by U.S. senators, you're just like, whoa, the level of the conversation about this band is just, you know, shot to the ceiling. Like, this is a band that's being talked about on a national political platform as, like, you know, one of the great evils in society. You know, this is no longer just an un underground phenomenon.
want to talk about Ace Ventura. Sure, <laughs> sure. How did that all happen? I'm not 100% sure, but as far as we were told, um, Jim Carrey actually knew who the band was and liked some of our music. You know, he did let us know that when he first heard the vocals, he's like, well, I, I just had to laugh. I'd never heard anything like that before. It sounded so crazy. I've met a lot of people that said the first time they heard Cannibal Corpse was by seeing that movie, Ace Ventura, and they said, in fact, that was the first time they'd ever heard death metal. I, I mean, I meet people like that on every tour to this day. Ace Ventura was another one of those little weird cultural moments that allowed them to elevate their presence and sell more records. In a lot of ways, Cannibal Corpse are kind of America's version of Napalm Death as far as kind of a cultural talking point for what people think crazy heavy metal is and what it's supposed to sound like. And once it starts selling, then everybody kind of swoops in and wants to be involved. So by the mid-90s, some of the Florida death metal bands were having some mainstream success. But the scene as a whole had kind of become formulaic. And I actually remember losing interest in death metal because it felt stale and overdone. So the question is, what did it take to make extreme metal relevant again? In my first film, Metal a Headbanger's Journey, I explored Norwegian black metal and the controversy surrounding a series of church burnings and murders that happened in the early 90s. Church burnings and all these things that I support 100% and it will be done much more in the future. But this time, I'm focusing on the music. And to get started, I'm gonna go reunite with an old friend. Yeah, man, we rule. If people don't recognize it, fuck them. So th the last time we met, it became kind of this classic moment. <laughs> it was a classic moment, though, for sure. <laughs> when you gave me that sloppy handshake, I was thinking, who the fuck is this? Looked like a fucking nerd. What is this, some kind of school project or whatever? And then you come up with some negative stuff, like uh, black metal is on the way down. Do you have any comments about that? Well, yeah, I have a comment. Fuck you! You know what I mean? It was on my day off, so I had a couple of beers. And now I'm happy to uh, get another chance to uh, start fresh again, so. Well, we'll get on to the new interview. Um, going back to your beginnings, what was the sound and the feel of the music that you guys were trying to create? We, um, when we started to play in bands, we started playing Venom covers and Dead Kennedys covers and stuff like that. And then when we started to make our own music, it just became what it became. In the beginning, we started Primitive, which was just natural. And the moment we wrote the first four songs, we just knew that nobody had ever heard anything like this. We wanted to continue the Primitive sound that bands like Bathory and Celtic Frost, because thrash metal had toned down, became more straight. Death metal, on the other hand, became more technical. I saw what Chuck did with Death, and I was going, fucking hell, it sucks. Sorry to say. So we wanted to escape the modern metal style, the clicky drums and all that. We were drawn to just playing. At even. A big part of that first wave of black metal is that emphasis on keeping it stripped down, basic, very raw sounding. The look of it, the aesthetic, the imagery was very different than what was going on in death metal. On the one hand, you know, it was much more theatrical because, you know, artists were wearing corpse paint. They were painting their faces white with black around it to resemble actual corpses. But at the same time, they had a kind of lo-fi approach. Like the album covers were literally a, a shitty photo of a dude in white makeup in the woods that had been photocopied probably five times. The idea of having one band member with paint on the cover in black and white, that became iconic. It's sort of, uh, a lot of people did that afterwards. You know, when we did makeup and the imagery that came along with it, it had this very 
dark uh, atmosphere, which definitely helped to create mystery and danger. And that's very different from sunny Florida. So where was the inspiration for the visuals coming from? It's all a big mix, but, but of course the landscape in Norway with the mountains and forests and everything, uh, definitely it, it influenced us and it just made everything larger than life, you know, extremely epic. You've got these guys who look distinctive. They've got crazy medieval weapons. They're in these dramatic woods. These are powerful images. It gets the imagination going. And so I've interviewed Norwegian bands and they said that their fans come up to them and say, you know, do you live in the woods? Are there trolls? How many wolves have you fought? They think it's Lord of the fucking Rings. And for a lot of the Norwegians, some of them play up to it. The roots of Norwegian black metal lay in reclaiming extreme metal's primitive sound and imagery. But it didn't stay primitive for long. And it was Norway's Dumu Borgir who turned black metal into a full-on spectacle. that if we're going to do something special, we're going to have to follow our vision and, and not uh, look at what other people necessarily want you to do, like a so-called written black metal rule or something like that. Our sound at the time was pretty fresh with the so-called old school black metal look, you know, but the music was more modern, using a lot of keyboards and synthesizers, which at the time was uh, <laughs> not looked, uh, <laughs> looked upon as something that was true or whatever. We already had the typical guitars, bass and drums, but we were always subconsciously looking for that wall of sound, you know, and not that keyboards make that wall of sound, but it definitely makes for a great atmosphere. And that's what we in Dimu always been all about, is the atmosphere, you know. Dimu Borgir turned black metal into almost opera even using whole orchestras at the time to create this big music, this very theatrical, almost cab kind of sound. They are a little ridiculous, but they're also annoyingly catchy. <laughs> when we went on stage, we wanted to have a full package, like a complete thing, not just the music. That's how we gained so much of a bigger fan base and kind of paved the way for a lot of other bands too and opened up the borders, so to speak. Dimu Borgir broadened the horizons of black metal, and they became Norway's biggest black metal band. But meanwhile, England's cradle of filth were shattering. What do you think has set you apart from what people typically think as the black metal sound or look. I didn't just go straight for the jugular with the whole satanic thing. The lyricism sort of explored more gothic terrain, more poetry and people like Byron and Polidori and Lovecraft and Clyde Barker. So it's mythology as well, that derived from, I suppose, the British aesthetic. Danny is unquestionably the heart and brain of Cradle because he brings in his own passion for archaic poetry, mm -hmm. for hammer horror films, for uh, gothic imagery. He's got a great eye for visuals that work, visuals that appeal. Pringle of Filth had that sort of accessibility on that level where a goth chick who otherwise listens to like Marilyn Manson can appreciate a Cradle of Filth, whereas, you know, a Dark Throne just sounds like fucking, you know, like a, a jet engine to her, you know? Cradle of Filth has that sort of palatability by a more mainstream audience. You know, I dare anybody when they say they start a band and they don't imagine themselves up on a big stage, you know, playing to a lot of people. When Cradle of Filth was founded, that's how we pictured ourselves. You know, we didn't know necessarily that we were going to get to those lofty heights, but that was the aim. But as you know, I mean, there always seemed to be that code within the black metal camp, which is sort of like, it's supposed to stay underground. Yeah, but I don't understand why these people are making the rules here. Right. There are no rules, that's the whole point of it. And I just think it's bigoted. Timu Borgir and Cradle Filth were kind of the, the whipping boys for a lot of the true uh, black metal underground. I understand why 
the true black metalers were rallying against it because black metal was never meant to be pretty. It was supposed to be ugly and awful and it was supposed to scare you. You weren't supposed to ballroom dance to it. In the early 2000s, black metal is as big as it has ever been, but you know the real tried and true diehard bands have either rejected the style or moved on or broken up entirely. Black metal had defined itself so insularly as this sort of elitist underground movement that it sort of defined its own shelf life. I want to ask you a question that I think is maybe one of the questions that you got mad at me for asking last time. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. Maybe it's because it's a stupid question. I don't know, but oh, I'll yeah. ask it again. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people say that by the early 2000s, black metal had kind of fractured. I think that uh, when you say it like that, that it fractured, uh, then I guess you're right. I never thought about it. So it wasn't, wasn't that it went down, it just went all kinds of different directions and people were confused. And I can understand maybe that was the thing. Yeah. They confused you, so I didn't get it at all. But yes, it was a very <laughs> stupid question. In the early 2000s, black metal was kind of in disarray, and apart from a few bands in Poland and elsewhere, death metal and grindcore weren't really innovative anymore. And I remember feeling like the walls were kind of closing in on extreme metal, and the genre really needed a new spark. And then a spark did come from a Norwegian band who managed to break free from their black metal roots. I want to start with where you guys were at when you began as a band. Uh, when we got started, it was in uh, early 91. We came from the kind of uh, kind of small Norwegian death metal scene, you know, before the black metal revolution in Norway. And uh, suddenly at a point, everybody decided to stop playing death metal <laughs> and uh, go into this more primitive Venom and Celtic Frost inspired sound. You have Mayhem, Darth Throne, Emperor, a couple of others, you know. So it was definitely a community of bands. If you look at early Enslaved, they were as pagan sort of Viking black metal as it gets, like wearing fucking chain mail, like sitting on thrones with like a big flagon of mead, you know? But over the years, they've progressed into this much more sort of open-ended progressive metal band, you know? And the, the visuals have become much more psychedelic, almost like you took sort of a black metal band and fused them with Tool or something. Enslaved in the early 90s was very focused around the extreme metal or black metal idea of having the narrative in the guitar and using the vocal almost like an effect. But then, you know, we moved to where the guitars would also be part of the narrative, but would start pulling a little bit back in terms of letting the vocals be what's carrying the story forward. Given that you've gone through all this evolution and experimentation, how important now is it for you to be extreme? It's not, not important to be extreme at all, actually. It's not important how fast you can go or how much of a tough guy you are. It's about how far you're willing to put your emotions into the music that makes it extreme metal for me. Learning that what it means to be extreme in metal music today is expanding far beyond what it meant to Venom and Celtic Frost. And there's a French band who is taking extreme music in some unlikely ideological directions and whose style has been called eco-metal. So France is not a country traditionally known for a lot of metal bands. 
and I wanted to ask you, has it helped you or hindered you being from France? At first, I remember it was a big handicap because there is no, in France, there's no uh, tradition of international managers and record companies and stuff. Now, today, when I look back on our career, I think it's a good thing that we come from France. I think we were able to develop something that was very, very personal. What makes Gojira unique is, you know, first of all, they're from France. And France is known as a country that has not produced much good metal. And also, lyrically, they're doing their own thing. They're singing about the environment. They have songs about whales. They're calling attention to what's happening to the Earth, how mankind is, you know, just wrecking the planet. And I think there's that intellectual angle that's really, really appealing to people. And you don't see bands really doing stuff like that. Basically, what I'm saying in my lyrics a lot is that we are nature. Nature is not just something outside of ourselves. I mean, everything is nature. This microphone is nature. This, this house is nature. And we are connected to each other by this, um, this universe. <laughs> Why is this aggressive style a good vehicle to talk about the environment? I think the music is growing with the society. It's a hard, brutal world we live in. Communication, interaction, medias, everything is so intense and crushing. The faster the society goes, the faster the music goes. At the same time, we want to calm things down and we want to be more simple. We don't need to use gore or to put a lot of blood in our videos and stuff like that because life is brutal enough. This is a big question and it's more of a philosophical one. What is the value of extreme metal to the evolution of metal music? An outside listener would say that extreme metal is like this limiting form, that it has, you know, this formula, crunching guitars, the double bass, the extreme style vocal, you know. I mean, that's what defines it. But in any art form, it's what you do within those limits within that box. I mean, if you just think about a band like Neurosis or Gojira or Cattle Decapitation, they're doing such different things and yet they all fall under this umbrella of extreme metal. I would say that since really since the early 80s, the most creative stuff, the most challenging stuff in metal has been coming from extreme metal. One of the reasons for that is that the underground is a place where people can work relatively undisturbed and do their own thing without worrying too much about what a mass audience would think. We are music lovers, we are art lovers, not genre lovers. I mean, there are no limits, there are no rules. If there are rules, it's not music. This final journey of metal evolution into the history of extreme metal has revealed to me that as heavy metal continues to grow, extreme metal is where the spirit of the original metal underground remains alive and well. It explicitly resists the mainstream and it pushes music to the edge. And for this reason, extreme metal may in fact be the most important subgenre in the story of metal's evolution. So this is what I'm all about.
Hey there, this is Sam Dunn from Banger Films and I'm here to extend a massive thank you to everyone who helped make the Extreme Metal Lost episode happen. As you know, this took us a long time and it was a lot of work and it took a lot of patience from a lot of you to give us the time to do it right. So I can't thank you enough. I'm so excited that this is finally seeing the light of day. But we're not done. As many of you know, there are many more subgenres in the Metal Evolution uh, family tree whose story has not been told. So if you go to Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, you can let us know which episode you want to see next and help us continue the Metal Evolution journey.